Hello, welcome to the Small Business Briefing, the Monday edition. I'm Brian Kelly, CEO of the Small Business Association of Michigan. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Miller, Vice President of Marketing and Strategic Communications for SBAM. Welcome to today's show. As always, we wanna say a quick thank you to our sponsor, Marana Group. Um, I just worked with Marana Group. I have a wonderful experience with their team members. Um, we're doing a member mailing and I've enjoyed the best customer service and pretty quick turnaround time. So if you have a data document or distribution project coming up, I encourage you to reach out to them. Um, Brian, let's start with a quick update. A federal judge in Florida struck down uh, the Biden administration's mask mandate for airplanes and other public transport methods. So what's what's the next step here? Yeah, this comes on the heels of, uh, of a two, about a two week extension that the administration uh, implemented on the mask mandates on planes and other uh, public transportation last week. And, um, and at that point, you got a sense that there was kind of a battle brewing here because you had uh, the airline um, the airlines themselves had an open letter to the administration asking them to, to, um, to eliminate this rule that pretty much everywhere else, including recommendations from the CDC, that these rules had been uh, displaced or set aside, and, uh, but not on public transit systems. And, um, and so the Federal Transportation Commission and the CDC uh, said, hey, we're going to extend these out because you got this BA2 variant. Things are rising in certain areas of the um, of the country and really kind of pronounced in the in the northeast, but um, they said, "Hey, we're just going to extend it out for a few more weeks and see what happens." And um, a federal judge then uh, out of Florida, just today, like just a little while ago, um, struck it struck that um, that rule down. And what was interesting to me was that it was struck down on the basis of uh, the the agency exceeding its statutory authority. Which um, you know the the, the statute the statutory authority to require masks by uh, the um, you know essentially by the CDC and and Transportation Commission I hadn't really heard it questioned in at least the way the news is reporting this decision at this point there might be more to it so I was a little bit surprised at uh, at the reasoning that it was an um, exceeding statutory authority what I would have thought would would be more likely. Was uh, was an inconsistency between the regulation itself not matching the CDC's regulation or the CDC's recommendations for everything else. The CDC is not recommending masks for about 95% of the counties across the um, in any situations um, outside of healthcare and uh, congregate living, um, uh, like nursing homes and, and, and places like that. Um, except for in uh, public transit. And, um, and so the, the idea of uh, there being an inconsistency I could see for the basis of it. So we'll see where it goes from here. My guess is that the, it'll, be, it'll be appealed. And um, in fact, I'm sure that it will be appealed. Even though it's a short-term thing, I'm sure the administration doesn't want this, um, this particular power kind of left in, even though it's just a few weeks from maybe expiring anyway, um, they're going to want to try to preserve that power if they uh, they can. But obviously, for many people have traveled, um, just kind of gone through through this. Like you, you know, I I, I was on a plane just last week, and it was I walked into the airport. Um, there's so few places where a mask even comes up anymore. So I walked in and quickly realized that oh yeah, I'm supposed to be. And they you know told me they had mask little dispenser things uh, sitting there in the in the aisle and, and to grab one, but it's not, it's, it's so absent from so many places. It's not even kind of in my mindset to grab one from the car. Actually, honestly, when I have, when, when I find, usually I find one like on the floor or something like that on my car, I know, uh, kind of defeats purpose. But anyway, the, um, uh, it's, for now it's struck down, whether or not that will stand will be kind of an interesting thing to follow. One of the last remaining regulations that affect just regular people in their regular lives. Yeah, I'm sure there'll definitely be some progress on, um, on this between now and our show Thursday. So we'll keep everyone updated then. Uh, last week, you uh, explained the candidates who had already thrown their hat into the ring officially for the Republican um, gubernatorial race. We have, another, we have another candidate who is officially filed. This will be a pretty big week because I think that the biggest names on the Republican side will file will be filing their signatures. So to get on the ballot, it's, it's not just filing paperwork. 
You have to go out there and get petition sign signatures over 15,000 valid signatures. So you wanna get more because there's always some that are invalidated for some reason. Today, James Craig, who polling shows is the front runner at this point, although there's others that have been kind of gaining and, and, uh, and getting competitive with him, filed signatures and uh, 21,700 or so that were, uh, that were filed. Uh, I expect there'll probably be three more uh, that file this week and there could be some other surprises, but ultimately you're gonna have between eight and 10 uh, Republicans that are vying for that position. Uh, the governor, of course, Governor Whitmer has already uh, turned in her signatures. There will not be a, a contest on the Democratic side of, uh, of that primary. So um, it's gonna be a pretty crowded field, but I expect that this week we'll see yet um, three more, at least three more candidates in uh, Kevin Rinke, Perry Johnson, and Tudor Dixon uh, filing, uh, filing their signatures, and in which case it'll be nine candidates. Um, I hadn't go ever gone back to say, what's the most crowded you know, uh, primary field of either party in going back? And, um, and this could end up being the uh, most crowded primary since the primary system has been in place here in Michigan. So uh, pretty big field, um, lots of, I expect lots of action and, uh, and, uh, and advocacy that's happening over the coming, uh, coming months. Maybe, you know, what was, with that many candidates, it's kind of hard to invite people on the, on the briefings and, and things. We have the governor on uh, from time to time. Maybe you know, some of these candidates kind of separate themselves out from the pack. Maybe we'll bring a few on. Um, they, many, many have engaged with us and our members. We love when candidates come to talk to us. When the governor talks to us or other people who aspire, uh, aspire to come uh, to be governor, come and, and talk with us. It's something that we think is really important engage, engagement directly with small businesses and, uh, and showing that they have that uh, an interest because obviously uh, the perspective of, of the small business owner can be very, very different than, um, than uh, other uh, cohorts, other citizens out there in the landscape. There's just something about signing the front side of that paycheck that, uh, that, that offers a different perspective on what it takes to make our communities work. Absolutely. The candidates always say that they support small business, that small business is the backbone of our economy. That was, you know, for, for those of you in the in, inside here, uh, take, take a drink. Uh, but it's really good when we can engage with our members and really hear from them firsthand about what, about what matters. Um, so here in Michigan, the House Democrats reintroduced a package of bills that they say reduces payroll theft. What's in this package? Yeah, this is a, a package that unfortunately has come up a few terms in a row. We've been successful in stopping it. And what they say is that there's, there's something called payroll theft, and that's where people are, are paid as independent contractors that ought to be employees. And um, ultimately out, you know, kind of the political world, this is like an anti-outsourcing kind, of kind of a move, making it more difficult, more stringent for a, uh, a business to outsource for some services. What I think that we are constantly having to, um, to educate this particular caucus about is that many small businesses exist because bigger businesses outsource some services to others, specialists that work in areas like accounting or law or marketing or advertising. There's a lot of professional services where the entire business model and business plan of, of the small business is to serve uh, other businesses that, that have certain professional functions that they outsource. And, um, and what this package of bills does is it really narrows the scenario where you can, uh, where you can classify somebody as a contractor com as compared to um, a, a direct em employee. This is already a very um, active area of, of law. It's complicated and, um, and you have to be careful with how you comply. And this would make that much more difficult. I'm confident that we will beat this again. We've had to in the last couple of terms, we'll, we'll do it again. Uh, but just to make it uh, to, to make you aware that this is one of those areas that uh, very, very uh, consistently and persistently over years that there are efforts to try and uh, make it more difficult for businesses to contract with other businesses to provide services. And as we know from from a small business perspective, having an expert on staff in every single area of kind of professional work that you need, is not realistic for the vast majority of small businesses. And so this is an area where I think maybe their target 
is more uh, trying to stop big businesses from uh, from outsourcing some of their activities, uh, which that in and of itself is, I think, is none of the politicians' business. But anyway, the um, but I, I think the collateral in this case that that we, we have to constantly re-educate them on the collateral damage is that you're uh, if you if they were successful in getting this passed, it would really narrow the opportunities for many of our members, the the small businesses that the politicians always say are the backbone of the economy. It would it would really um, narrow and in some cases outright destroy the business the very business model behind uh, professional small businesses that offer professional services. All right, um, next subject matter is school enrollment and school enrollment is up this year. What is that telling us? Yeah, this is a, this is welcome news. So we've we've seen um, well, generally over the last 20 years, we've seen declining uh, school enrollment because our demographics are, are working against us. We talked a lot about that. But in the pandemic, it really had uh, had declined. And there were a lot of families that either they were not comfortable sending their kids to school or school wasn't consistent enough as on again, off again. And so it's just easier for parents to say, you know, what, we're going to homeschool for uh, for a while or do something else, maybe private school, maybe whatever, and uh, online school, as long as the local public school is going back and forth. And, um, and so as schooling has become more consistently available this year, uh, when they did the counts, and as we see the, the numbers of enrollments uh, for this, uh, for this uh, particular school year, it's actually up about not quite a half a percent, 0.4 percent above the previous um, above the previous year. So it came in at 1,443,000. And um, last year it was 1,437,000 uh, students total enrolled. Now, uh, for perspective, I think it's important to keep in mind that it was almost 1.5 million before the pandemic. So it's still down more than 50,000 students. And, um, and so that's, um, that's concerning for sure. Uh, but there's a uh, but at least it's it stopped declining and that's the first step to growth is to stop declining so um, I, I think it is kind of a nod to the fact that public schools across the state are more predictably reliably available and uh, and so parents are more confident saying okay we can get on with our lives now send our kids to school we know it's good the school is going to be open and um, and we and uh, we move on, and and I think it's reasonable to expect that there's some segment of the um, of the population that is out of the labor force now. That this um, this would would maybe foreshadow that uh, that that those adults, some segment of of the adults out of the labor force, would would be ready to jump back in. So maybe a little bit of a glimmer of hope here when it comes to workforce shortages. Long-term, still a lot of trends working against us, but um, I wanted to point it out because I feel like we always deliver a lot of you know, tough news on this briefing, but uh, this, I think, a, a pretty good sign that it, it's, it's actually kind of crested, it looks like, in terms of the uh, decline or maybe bottomed out and start to grow a little bit. And who knows, maybe, uh, maybe by the time we do the fall counts, it'll be back to pre-pandemic levels. A really good segue into the next, uh, next set of topics here. So I want to share three headlines. Two of them we have shared on our website, and they're from our partner, ASC, the American Society of Employers, and we've shared them in our Monday newsletter today. Um, so here's three headlines, and I want you to tie them all together. One, turns out the great resignation may be followed by the great regret. Two, ASC releases employee turnover survey highlighting great resignation woes. And the third is, is it the great resignation or the great job switcheroo? Yeah, so it's kind of interesting as we get more insight from last, last member October, November, the, the number of quits nationwide was over 4 million yeah, for, per, for successive months. And so it was, we've never really seen that type of turnover. And I think you might recall at that point that I had, um, had opined that probably most of those people are not leaving the workforce, but because you had a lot of retirements, there's creating more opportunities and people are moving a lot within uh, the workforce as opposed to um, these resignations being uh, people leaving overall. Now the ASE, um, the American Society of Employers, um, the survey that they had referenced in, um, in their article gives some good kind of overview that I thought I'd start with. So, 
First is the, uh, the voluntary turnover rates among uh, private sector employees in, um, in 2021 was 17%, but it's very different whether it's hourly or, um, or white collar. So, uh, and these are the terms of these classifications that their surveys use, but hourly at uh, 26%, and um, about 12% for white collar employees. So, um, and th so those are voluntary um, turnover and positions. So people that weren't fired. If you look at the, um, so the average was 17, the uh, of voluntary turnovers, 26% among hourly and 12% among white collar. But the overall, when you include involuntary uh, turnover, so positions, uh, people that were fired or asked to leave, uh, 21 percent or 25 percent, sorry, in in 2021. So that is um, that's a that's a you know a quarter of the workforce is pretty massive, and uh, there's a lot of changes that um, in 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 this survey that employers are um, are implementing to try to um, to try to change that to stem that that tide. And some of the things that were that are uh, common among employers, 80 percent. Um, that are conducting exit interviews to better understand why people are, are leaving. Uh, we do that at SBM. If somebody leaves SBM, we always do exit interviews to try and understand what's the experience like, been like. Now that you're leaving, you know, if there's anything you're holding back, please, please let us know. And uh, what, and it's a, it's a really good uh, tool to, uh, to implement if, if the employee is willing. Um, allowing remote work, 71% of the respondents of the survey uh, allowing remote work. As, um, Assessing compensation rates uh, to the um, to the market and trying to match, um, fifty nine percent, and then um, improving or implementing better on employee onboarding experience, fifty one percent, and then um, expanding or introducing flexible work options at forty three percent. So a few of the insights from that kind of that overview. Now, um, in terms of uh, the resignation versus you know people just changing. Jobs. One of the uh, the articles that we put out was it even I think maybe it was in our um, in our uh, email today that uh, so check out you know the details and in, uh, in in the article if you're a member of ours and if you're not please become a member uh, spm.org the um, but this um, with the uh, with the overall national unemployment rate at three point six percent there's a there's it's good evidence that most people are are not really leaving the workforce, but but staying uh, in and just changing jobs. And um, and so what the what what ASC did was to, to go through in this article and to really um, take a look at these um, impressions that people have about uh, about what's happening out there in the, in the workforce. That that Americans don't really want to work anymore. That most Americans hate their jobs, and that the resignation is kind of a um, a, an example of or an outcome of the fact that people hate their jobs. And, and so there's, a, there's additional insights research surveys that have been done that have, uh, that have showed that, um, that really none of, those, um, none of those ideas or impressions are at least vastly true or appear to be vastly true. Uh, so the idea that people don't want to work anymore. If you look at labor force participation rate among people in their prime working years, so this is 25 to 54, age 25 to age 54, you'll see that in that group, that workforce or labor force participation rate is as high as it's ever been. And uh, that's, that is great news. You know, we, and we've talked a lot about people over age 55. We've seen a big exit, younger workers with children. We've seen an exit, especially women. But 25 to 54, um, we, we actually see pretty high labor force participation rates. And so people in the prime of their careers. And, um, and so there's been a lot of switching around, uh, but, but not leaving the, the workforce. Um, there was a, um, uh, there many reports in the pandemic that satisfaction actually um, increased. Um, and so there, you know, there, the, the idea that uh, people just hate their jobs right now, um, there are a lot of things that happened in the pandemic that have, have actually helped with, with the way that employees view uh, their jobs. So they make a reference to a, a, a survey that found that, um, that job satisfaction during the, the height of the pandemic actually increased, didn't decrease. 
and um, and then the uh, the great resignation being a, a reflection of the of people having a, a hatred for their jobs. Um, the uh, let's say it's called Angus Reed Global uh, recently concluded that the number of employees saying they were um, they were thinking about quitting soared in 2021, rising significant uh, significantly more than the change in uh, job satisfaction. So if you look at the number of people saying that they're satisfied with their job is, um, is uh, it, you compare it to those that are thinking of looking, you see that there's a lot of people that are, think, that are looking, that are thinking about changing or have been thinking about changing, that also say they're satisfied with their current job. And so there's not a problem with their job, it's just that retirements create opportunities. And so people naturally want to explore those opportunities. The, uh, the final thing I'll say about this was um, is a, 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 the idea of uh, the great resignation being followed by the great regret. Um, really, really interesting survey by a, uh, a job search site called Muse, M-U-S-E, and uh, is of more than 2,500 employees. So not a, not a small sampling here, which I found quite interesting. Almost three quarters of them, 72%, experience either surprise or regret that the new position or new company they quit their job for turned out to be very different from what they were led to believe. And get this, nearly half, 48% of these workers said that they would try to get their old jobs back. And, um, and that, you know, I guess I'm not terribly surprised because, you know, we always kind of assume the grass is greener on the other side. And, um, and yet, uh, this, you know, pretty, pretty interesting survey, more in insights will, uh, will, will come out, but this is a pretty interesting survey that would suggest that, um, that maybe the, the shifting around wasn't all it was, it was cracked up to be. So what the, really my takeaways from this are that, um, that people in their prime uh, working years, 25 to 54, are, they're still in the game as much or more actually than ever. They're just moving up and finding opportunity. So the idea of creating pathways for growth and opportunity might be a good strategy uh, to hold on to people uh, for longer. And, um, and who, who knows, it might be uh, if you lost a great employee, uh, it might make sense to give them a, and you still got that position open, to give them a call and uh, see how it's been going because maybe they'll be ripe to come back. All right, well, speaking of surveys, SBAM is going to release our spring survey tomorrow morning. So if you are a member, and like Brian said, if you're not, you should be, uh, you'll receive an email from us and we really wanna get your input on a variety of subjects, including um, your uh, workforce challenges. So, um, all right, we it is Data Monday. We're gonna get to the data, but before we do, um, China and other parts of Asia are experiencing, I think, their worst wave of COVID so far. So what's, let's share some perspective on how their COVID wave is going to impact our already struggling supply chain here. There's some stats from China that are coming out in terms of what's happening with their economy, especially in the last month since they've impl implemented some of the most severe and strict shutdowns or lockdowns. Uh, economic lockdowns uh, that we have seen uh, throughout the, this entire process. Uh, before in China, they, they've been doing this all along, localized, and keep in mind when they lock down one city, in many cases the, whole, the city has a population bigger than our whole state. But when, they, uh, when they've done this, it's been kind of localized and in, in terms of how they report, it looks like it's been very successful. But, uh, but that's changing right now. And, uh, and so, as they deal with being in a position where um, they've got for the first time ever, including in the very, in, in Wuhan, in the very, very beginning of the pandemic, um, more COVID positive cases today than ever, that um, it's affecting more places. And uh, in places like Shenzhen, that is a, uh, that's like a tech capital or cap tech hub of, of China that, that will have implications or ramifications when they when their production slows down or stops, have major implications on supply chains all over the world. And then um, and then uh, in terms of their biggest city, Shanghai, but there's a bunch of other places that are literally on lockdown. And the lockdowns in China, they're not like lockdowns here. Like people literally have to stay 
in their houses, or it's kind of an interesting dynamic. They can go to work, but they have to stay at work, like sleep there if they decide to go to go to work. So um, when you when you're locked down, you are locked down, and uh, and so uh, naturally things are going to start to to uh, to change. And and the reason I bring this up is because there are several aspects of um, of our economy, the global economy, that are, are tied together. And here, where we're dealing with supply chain disruptions and rising costs, China taking these actions right now, at a time when we're already, you know, we're hoping we've hit the high, the, the peak of inflation, but additional shortages caused by supply chain disruptions and um, and uh, and and the slowdown in their uh, overall capacity to interact and make things work smoothly uh, could take what many economists are hoping is the peak and make it so that it's just a, a step on the way up. So um, there's actually um, growing concern that uh, that depending on how long these things last in uh, in China in particular, but in, in Asian countries um, overall, that this could really um, this really could slow down our uh, our prospects for recovery. So they had um, their overall economy was on pace to grow at about 4.8 percent. Um, in the first quarter, but if you look at January, February, it was that's where most of that growth came from, and it really did drop down in March when the when the lockdowns had started. Uh, they really that sounds like a lot of growth to us, but the way that their economy works, they really do require uh, a lot of year over year growth. Um, the the country targeting five point five percent. The part that I think if I were in charge of Chinese economy. That would really make me uh, most concerned, though, is that their uh, retail sales, which is a, a which is a big indication of the confidence that consumers have. Remember, this is a massive market for that the entire world uh, sells into, the biggest consumer market in the world. Um, that the retail sales actually have dropped, and um, and that's not surprising when people are locked down like this. But that has that will have. Um, ramifications across the the globe as well. So um, the slowdown that started last March or started earlier in March is expected when the April numbers to come in to to show worse and um, have show that it has gotten worse. So um, I, I I would kind of liken this to the types of international disruptions that we see with Ukraine. You know we think of our economy as being something like hey you know we're back at it and 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 we we should be through the worst of it and now things get better and then there are these other factors that can exacerbate problems that we're having and um, so the the war uh, with russia and ukraine it was the first example of that and now um with with china really clamping things down in really important areas in terms of the way that the global supply chains work I think are going to have further ramifications, cause more shortages, which tend to push prices up, um, and uh, and that's a major risk that we that we face today. All right, as we wrap up today's show, let's take a quick look at the latest numbers for Data Monday. All right, so I'm going to pull up our um, our slides, and we're going to take a look at. Um, well, we're going to run, look at the United States first, and we actually will look at China so you can get a, a sense. So here are the different regions. Vermont happens to be the highest. Northeast, clearly the highest in the um, in the country. If we zoom in just on the last um, 90 days, you'll see that really it's the Northeast, the one that's trending up. And it doesn't look like it's gone up uh, much, but if you look at it, it, it really has doubled. So in a re relatively short period of time. So when you look at you know these things, it's like exponential growth. Um, and it, it, when you're coming off a small base, it doesn't look like much, but usually the way that COVID has worked in the past, it really does take a turn up. And I think that most epidemiologists now think it's a given or inevitable that it would happen um, that in terms of some sort of a wave this time. You can see clearly on the heat map that it is concentrated mostly in the Northeast at the moment. But I just wanna point out that over here, you see Washtenaw, Wayne, um, Macomb, Oakland, and uh, Livingston. That's where most of the people in Michigan live. So like the fact that those look a little darker, you're gonna see that show up here when we look at Michigan's trends. 
Um, here's the, uh, the national trends um, or the national um, numbers. I want you to pay attention. When we look at China, I want you to look at the, um, as compared to this, our peak got up to 800,000 cases in the US. Right now we're at, you know, 25 to 30,000. Um, so just remember that number. Um, and then um, ICU and uh, hospitalization, they have not started to go up, but they also stopped going down. So they kind of leveled off. But I want to point out that they are lower than at any point in this pandemic since the beginning. So that's great news of where we stand uh, today. But take a look at Michigan's numbers. Um, now, it looks like they've, they've jumped up. Now, the state started reporting data differently. They're doing it only once a week. And I think for a couple of weeks that it's going to make this the chart look a little look a little sharper on the increase because they report on one day you know they report on on a just one day per week so kind of the average gets smaller every day you get away from that day that they report see what i mean so so i think the numbers are going up but i think it, it looks like they're going up sharper here than what what is real we'll see when i <laughs> i guess in a few weeks if i'm right about that so you see that um here that that the um, that the numbers had gone uh, that they're um, they're reporting just weekly, and so they're higher on on those uh, on those days that they report. Um, but you do see hospitalization numbers up just slightly, but um, but up just a little bit. And then um, zooming in the last 90 days, you see this is just Michigan's numbers. Um, you know a little bit of a gradual increase, but pretty pretty flat. Uh, here's China. So obviously you know. A pretty good size spike compared to what they had before. They didn't have good testing back here, but still, um, their numbers ne never really got that high. Remember when I told you that you know our nation was at about you know 25 or 30 thousand cases? Okay, so China has 1. 3, over 1.3 billion people. Um, so these are still, by our standards, kind of uh, low. But when you have that many people that close together, um, you can see I mean, you can get a sense for why they might be. Uh, concerned and they don't have the population immunity that we have and their vaccinations are not as effective as the U.S. vaccinations. Uh, but their deaths still um, staying low. We see them starting to move just a little bit, uh, but overall low. I, I can't vouch for the accuracy of the numbers. I don't want to say that I think that um, China is a picture of transparency. I don't think that they are. I don't think that the reporting, you know, I think they try to show everything in the best light possible, but um, in terms of what they put out uh, publicly, but uh, but clearly, I mean, things are things are changing there. We saw it really in, in Hong Kong before, uh, but uh, it's really hitting all of the major population centers uh, in the country. And it will be um, I think it's, a, it's an open question whether or not this um, the policy of establishing zero COVID. Uh, so far, the Chinese government shows no signs of letting up on that as being their policy. And um, so we'll see how long they stick with it. But I think they're starting to pay economic costs that they had not had to contend with in the past. All right. Well, thank you all for tuning in. We do appreciate it. We will see you back here on Thursday. All right. See everybody on Thursday.